Welcome to Citizen Dialogue. Thank you. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the disease polio? Because most people that listen to our show who uses Facebook have pretty much forgotten about the disease. Yeah, it's it's incredible how quickly people can forget about a disease like polio. But it, it, it's it's a, a horrifying, uh, devastating, right. and painful disease. This is this is a disease where. Um, quite frankly, a, a child or even an adult can wake up uh, perfectly well and mobile in the morning, and by that evening be uh, restricted to uh, to their their bed, unable to walk, um, sometimes able to even breathe, um, and potentially for the rest of their life. Uh, the acute disease can strike very fast, um, paralyzing all the muscles or many of the muscles of the body, and uh, and causes a great deal of pain at the same time. Now, a very small proportion of people who are affected will uh, get better from the paralysis, but the vast majority will either die or, or uh, be left with um, a permanently paralyzed uh, state. And now that there's a vaccine, most countries have, have forgotten about the disease, but uh, even 50 years ago, the, the threat of polio would uh, horrify communities, and uh, communities in the U.S., in Europe, they would shut down, uh, they would shut down schools or swimming pools or other public uh, gathering places because of such a, uh, a tremendous fear, which has all, all but disappeared now, of course, uh, in the West. Yeah, I mean... Before the vaccine and before the successes to fight against this, how big was the, the actual problems throughout the world? Well, before the vaccine was developed in the uh, in the in the 1950s, this, this disease struck uh, almost every uh, community in the world, uh, either either in an endemic form, meaning a few cases every year, or else in terms of big epidemics that might sweep through. Um, and after the vaccine was developed, the disease disappeared rapidly in most of the industrialized world. But by uh, the year we started the eradication program in uh, in um, in uh, 1988. But there were probably still over, uh, still in the range of half a million children being paralyzed by this disease every single year. And in the vast majority of countries in the world, of course, almost all developing countries where uh, the disease was still endemic. So um, and literally hundreds of thousands of people, over a thousand children were being paralyzed every single day uh, in the developing world when this began. Yeah. I mean, how, how was the disease spread? That's also a question we, we got quite a lot. From me, I didn't catch the question. How, how did you? How did the the polio get spread around? How? how did okay, it sure. Yeah, polio is a disease that spreads through uh, through primarily through uh, unclean uh, uh, water or, or 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 food, usually in settings of poor. Uh, Sanitation. It's what we call a fecal-oral transmission route, uh, which means uh, the contamination of, of, of goods can transmit the uh, virus and, and result in uh, in it, uh, people ingesting the virus through their mouth, and then it gets into their intestines where it replicates, and then it invades their uh, bloodstream and eventually invades their nervous system where it causes all of the damage in, uh, and the paralysis. Right. And although even though you can, uh, even in settings where we have pretty good hygiene and good sanitation, the disease can still spread, however, and thus the need for a vaccine, which can uh, prevent anybody from getting infected, uh, well, not, not from getting infected, but from getting paralyzed by the disease. Yeah. I mean, if the vaccine would have been developed, uh, what scenarios could you see then for today if we had no vaccine? Oh, if we had no vaccine, polio would still be a disease which terrified populations everywhere in the world because this is a disease which will leave people permanently paralyzed and irrespective of uh, how rich or poor you are and uh, there's no cure for the disease. So if the vaccine had not been developed, we would still have epidemics of polio paralysis in uh, Western countries as well as in developing countries on a regular basis because there's no way to protect against uh, this disease aside from a vaccine. Yeah. I mean, in, the, in your TED Talk, you showed some really amazing stats from India and Nigeria. What happened in, in 2009 to get the results? You, you had them. 
Yeah, the, the India and Nigeria are the two most important countries for the polio eradication program right now because these are the two countries, uh, the biggest uh, what we call polio virus reservoir in Asia and the biggest polio virus uh, reservoir in uh, in Africa, respectively. And not only do they result in a lot of polio disease in those countries, but the virus from those countries also spreads to many many other countries that had had you know eradicated the disease and then get reinfected. But uh, two. 2009 and 10 saw an, an incredibly important uh, development in which we saw a 95% drop in the amount of polio in, in both of those countries. And that was a result of two factors, uh, really three factors, I guess. The first was the development of a new vaccine, a new formulation of the polio vaccine called the bivalent polio vaccine, which was targeted just at the last two types of polio in the world and thus made it more effective than the old vaccine, which targeted three viruses at once. The second thing was in each of these countries, there was very specific investments made in infrastructure and ways to reach children. That meant that more children actually got that new vaccine. And the third big difference was the real leadership uh, shown by the leaders in the infected states or provinces of these countries um, who actually got out and championed the need for parents to get their children vaccinated and then help make sure the resources were available available for that. So it was the combination of a new vaccine, new tactics to get to children and get the vaccine into them, and then, of course, the political will behind the program that resulted in the uh, stunning declines in virus we saw in both of those key countries last year. Yeah, thank you. Um, you also saw, uh, told us in the talk that the poorest countries would save $50 billion a year. Can you expand on that issue? What will they save money on them and how? Yeah. Actually, uh, the, the study looks at the next 25-year period, the period uh, um, from now until uh, what would be about 20 years after the last child hopefully would be paralyzed by polio. And it found that in that period, in that 20-25-year uh, to period, the total savings would be over $50 billion, um, just to be clear. Okay. And those savings are based on um, the amount of money spent in uh, developing countries and the uh, on children who are paralyzed by polio and the lost productivity um, as a result of this disease. Um, it's also based on some of the savings that would be incurred um, from what we call direct costs of treatment and vaccination against the disease. So it's a combination of the direct and indirect costs of this disease uh, that would be saved. And some of this money saved would definitely be av uh, available to go back into health systems in these countries and improve uh, the the, the health of these uh, children, these populations against other diseases. But the $50 billion estimate is actually the most conservative one. The group uh, from Harvard and Delft University who did the study also looked at a few other uh, factors, and they said due to the fact that the polio program delivers much more than just polio vaccine, also vitamin A and, and other vaccines, often and sometimes malaria bed nets, that the real savings were probably well over $100 billion during this period. Yeah, and this is the countries that need money the most as well. You know, the oh, that's a good point, actually. We should be clear that this 50 to $100 billion in savings are savings in the poorest countries of the world. This does not even include the savings in uh, industrialized countries or countries of the West as a result of polio vaccination. So this is looking just at those countries who are most vulnerable to the disease. Yeah. Um, some people who seen the Michael Moore movie Capitalism, where asked us, you know, he told he tells the story about this Jonas Salk, the inventor of the vaccine, who gave away the patent for free, and and uh, yeah, or uh, inspiration to to the, the movie maker and also some of the people who watched the movie. Can you tell us a bit more about this and and what this has done for the, the fight against polio? 
Well, actually, jo- Jonas Salk's uh, uh, generosity set a great precedent, uh, in, in fact. Now, the polio vaccine that we use in the polio program is not actually the vaccine that was made by Jonas Salk, which is an injectable polio vaccine, but rather the oral polio vaccine, which was made by, um, which was made by uh, Albert Sabin a few years later, licensed a few years later. But Albert Sabin... Um, he did a very similar thing. What he did was he took the viruses that he had developed, the vaccine viruses for the oral polio vaccine, and he donated those, uh, the, the vaccine, what we call seed strains, to WHO, the World Health Organization, with the responsibility on us to share those with any country or any company that might be willing to make the oral polio vaccine. And in this way, um, he tried to guarantee global access to his vaccine so that as many children as possible uh, could benefit. So the inventors of both polio vaccines, both uh, Dr. Salk and Dr. Sabin, really established a great precedence, um, which were absolutely critical to the polio program because it meant not only could we ensure that these vaccines could be made globally available, but also that there could be enough competition and access to these vaccines to make sure that they were affordable for children everywhere. So, yes, these were uh, were great, great gestures by great men and, and extremely important to the success of the program. Thank you. Uh, I mean, what will be needed to eradicate polio for good, I mean, these countries that still are affected? Well, there's a couple of things that need to be done to finish the job of polio forever. The first thing that we've got to do is make sure that uh, the wild polio virus is, 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 is eradicated completely in the last few places where it now survives. There's still a bit in northern Nigeria, Pakistan, southern Afghanistan, a few other places in Africa, and so where it's been reintroduced. So the first critical thing is to continue doing these massive immunization campaigns multiple times a year so that we can vaccinate uh, these kids and and get the virus stopped in those last few areas with the new vaccine. The second thing that we've got to do is have enough resources to maintain a good surveillance system so that if the virus is there, we'll be able to find it anywhere where it's lingering. And we'll need that for a couple more years, uh, not a couple, at least five years or, or so, even longer, to prove that the disease has been completely eradicated. Then uh, the final thing we'll have to do is, is stop using the oral polio vaccine itself. And so part of our work today is not only on the eradication part of the disease, but also on how we eventually stop using the vaccine, the oral vaccine, in as safe as way as possible. So those are the critical activities that are needed to get the job done. But there are two other pieces we need. The first is sustained political commitment. We need the leaders of the polio-infected countries and the wealthy donor, donor countries to be able to uh, ensure the uh, strategies are implemented in these places. And uh, linked to that, of course, is the last piece of the pie. We've got to have enough money to support the poorest countries in the world to, to do this. And right now, probably the most critical thing we're lacking uh, is, is the money to finish the job. Over the next two years, we We have a budget of about $2 billion dollars to vaccinate hundreds of millions of children and maintain surveillance around the world. Um, and against that budget, we're, we're short about $600 million dollars in financing. If we don't have that money to finish the job, we'll have to cut con- corners, and there's a big risk we could lose what is an incredible opportunity to eradicate one of the nastiest diseases man has ever known. Yeah. And many uh, of the viewers who... who when we first uh, explained that we were going to interview you and, and put up the, the TED talk, some people saw, the, saw it and, and they just realized that it is still a, a, a dreadful disease. And, and they asked, what, what can I do in my everyday life to help you and the, the program to eradicate polio for good? So what, what is the... Well, it really depends on where people live, of course, and the resources available to them. Sure. But the the uh, most important thing, um, if 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 you live in a in a wealthy uh, country or a country that has long rid itself of polio, the single most important thing you can do, an incredibly valuable thing, would be to organize 
people to lobby the politicians, to lobby the decision makers, to explain to them, look, we care about this disease and we care that we don't squander the chance to eradicate it forever. And we think that our uh, some of our uh, tax dollars should be going to help make sure this job is finished. That would be an incredibly valuable, uh, valuable contribution, raising the profile of the program in the countries where uh, where we, we need to uh, make sure um, we, we get the support. For people that live in countries where polio still exists, whether Nigeria or Pakistan or any other, it's also reminding your government, reminding your leadership that it's important to apply uh, themselves to getting this finished and making sure leaders and all of us are accountable to getting the job done. You know, really practically, some people say, well, who's working on this in my community? And in almost every community in the world, there's a Rotary Club. And uh, some people have decided to join Rotary or to team up with the local Rotary Clubs because it's a very, very concrete uh, group present everywhere in the world who've made this their top um, um, corporate priority, and it provides a direct way to get involved in um, raising money for the program, even traveling to some of the countries to see uh, see what's going on and to help uh, boost the program in those areas. So in many ways, uh, other people have come up to me and said, well, how, how do I make a contribution if I want to? And you just go to one of our websites, like polioeradication.org, and you follow the uh, links, and you'll get to a couple of our partners who'd be uh, delighted to help you with that problem. All right. That's it. Thank you very much, Bruce. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Jonas, for the chance to uh, provide your uh, listeners with a bit of an update.